Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur with your host, Steve Kidd, third generation minister and 30 year business coach. Listen in as amazing, world changing authors, speakers, and coaches share their struggles and victories. And hear from best selling authors' insight into how you too can live your life as a thriving entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur. Thanks for being with us here today. I so appreciate you. I love being able to get to spend some time with you here on the radio or a podcast or iTunes or iHeart or wherever you might be joining us from today. I love helping you thrive. In fact, the website, wehelpyouthrive.com, that's why I named it, is because I just love helping people thrive in their lives and in their business. Today is no different. Today is a day that we can take the risk Taking the risk is really scary sometimes. We get comfortable, even in the uncomfortable, even in the things that we should never be okay with, we should never be comfortable going through. Even in those situations, we very easily can find ourselves, uh, you know, getting comfortable with that pain, with that suffering, with status quo being the way that it has been, right? I know I'm probably the only one that has that issue, but um, for uh, the rest of you that don't, um, take my word for it, it's really easy to fall into that trap and to find ourselves saying, hey, you know, um, well, it's all right. I'll let it go for another day, right? And time goes by and we don't take the risk. But yet, when we step out, when we walk away from what is comfortable into that glorious opportunity, that amazing life that is just sitting there waiting for you, that's when the good stuff happens. That's when the exciting stuff in life can really explode into your life. That's the first step towards that marvelous future that you have in your life. Now, whenever we take that step, you know, we're talking about taking the risk. There is a risk involved in it. Um, We start a new company and we know going into it, we could fail. It happens. It happens a lot, unfortunately. But we still want the ability to try. That's what makes us feel alive, is when we step out into that skinny branch, hoping that it will support us to be able to really do what we're meant to do in life. Sometimes the hurts and pains of our past really want to hold us back. They want to tell us that we're no good, that we need to always accept in our lives less than. But I'm here to tell you today, that that thing, that burning passion within inside of you, that skill, that talent that you have, it's inside of you. It's screaming to come out. You feel it. I know you do. And I'm encouraging you today. Just take the first little tiny step that direction. All risk starts in the face of fear. And all risk starts with the tiniest little step. It may feel like, in fact, it often is, one of the greatest leaps of faith. But it's just a tiny little needlepoint move. It's just going from where we are here a little bit further and making a really powerful difference in our own lives and in the people in this world that we're meant to serve. And I think at the end of the day, that's really what the power behind and the reason for taking the risk really is. And that's the people that we're meant to serve. It's not about each and every one of us. It's about those people whose lives are in the balance, hoping and waiting, looking for help and hope. And if we take the risk, when we step out, then we not only thrive in our own life, but we can help them to live as a thriving entrepreneur. We're gonna take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back here on Thriving 
entrepreneur. If you're an author who's on a mission, stand out with your brand out. <laughs> Check this out, guys. Yep, everything's marketing, and marketing is everything. Your existing book can become a best selling book, or even, hey, like mine, a number one international best selling book in five days. Listen, if your business isn't known by everybody, it's obscurity and that's death, right? The same thing is true for your book. If you're not happy with the way your book is performing, you got that far and then it just fell off the face of the planet kind of feeling, go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Schedule a talk with Steve. It's risk-free. It's guaranteed. It's proven. We've done it thousands of times. What are you waiting for? Yes, yourbestsellertoday.com. This time next week, you could have a beautiful seal on your book and get the attention that you deserve. Reach the people that you came to serve. Come on now. What are you waiting for? Grab a pen. Here we go. All you got to do is book a call, yourbestsellertoday.com. Go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Book a talk with Steve. It's proven. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. All you have to do is say yes to your destiny. Welcome back to Thriving Entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome back to Thriving Entrepreneur. Thanks for listening today. We have some exciting guests for you, and I want to jump right into it. First up... Oh, this amazing young lady, you are going to love hearing her story and be so encouraged from where she's come from and all that she's now doing in the world. I hope that both you'll support the exciting stuff that she's doing in the world, but also that you will find encouragement in your own life to take the risk, to step out in faith, knowing that the world will rise up to meet you. Join me in welcoming Max Neese. Hey, Max, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. So Max, tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. So my name is Max. I just turned 20 a couple days ago. Um, I just also released my first song called No Good at Love that is about um, sexual abuse that I went through as a child and how it affects me today. Um, I have a bunch of songs that are going to be coming out this year and next year that I've been working on for about two years now. And they all surround, um, or they all talk about, or the lyrics kind of explain just how my relationship with my father and abuse that I went through in his care has affected me and my life and how I've dealt with it and what emotions it's brought up. And yeah, I'm kind of, I just started writing music to initially help myself and getting it out of me, getting out like all of the emotion and feelings that I was feeling and trying to navigate and deal with. But now it's kind of to help others and to show others that you can make light out of any situation and there's always hope and there's always light at the end of the, the tunnel and you're not alone ever. And everyone goes through these kinds of experiences on some kind of level and it's okay to talk about and it's okay to feel what you feel and all of that. So how are you doing? I mean, where would you say you are now in the healing process? Um, now in the healing process, I'd say I'm definitely, I don't want to say that I'm completely healed because I feel like there's always room for growth and improvement, but comparing myself to a year ago, even, or two years ago, I am in such a new, different, stronger place. I've discovered self-love and self-respect and I guess today I'm just kind of practicing that. I'm practicing what I've been learning in the past few years on my healing journey and just trying to stay on a good path and in a good mindset and trying to help others with what I've learned. What would you say was the catalyst moment that helped you be able to move from you know, self-loathing and all of that kind of stuff to beginning to do some impactful things to help you? Um, well, my uncle 
um, who is a spiritual life coach. I started working with him about a little over a year ago and he was what really pulled me out of my deep dark hole. I was, before I started working with him, every time my dad was brought up, I would start shaking and I was fearful of everything in my life. And I didn't love myself. I didn't believe in myself. I didn't think that I was capable of anything basically. And after starting to work with him, I started discovering self-love and respect for myself. And that really turned my life around doing work with him. And the song is called No Good At Love. Um, it's your first EP release. Um, tell us a little bit about the song. So the song was actually created over a Zoom meeting with my producer who was in Australia at the time and my co-writer who lived in Los Angeles. Um, but so I had this memory come back for me of my sexual abuse that had always kind of been in my mind, but it just had gotten really clear um, before I had wrote this song. And I heard this one song by this artist. I don't even really, I can't remember her name right this minute, but the song is called Dog Teeth. And it's about a similar experience that she went through personally. And that song just pulled so much emotion out of me. And I would listen to the song for hours and just sob. And it just hit me in a different way. And after I cried to this song for an hour straight, I felt so good. You know, like I felt like I released this huge, heavy sadness that was like hanging over me. And I felt freed in a way. And I also felt connected to her and like, wow, this girl went through exactly what I went through. And she talks about other girls going through that too. And I'm not this weird, crazy person. Like there are others that experience the same thing I do. And that inspired me to just start writing right away. And I probably wrote about this experience that I had, my sexual abuse, uh, for maybe like a week or two. And then I texted my producer and my co-writer and I was like, I have to write this song. And we all got on the Zoom meeting and I told them about the song that I had been listening to and what it had done for me and what how I wanted to pretty much do the same thing in my song. And then it was created. What's your favorite uh, line or lyric from the song? Um, I think of like, out of all of them, my top favorite is wash away what you did to me, wash me clean. Um, because be, the feeling of not being clean was a huge thing for me growing up. And it was a very big obsession that um, affected my life. I would, at some point I was taking multiple showers a day, like obsessively because I could not feel comfortable in my own body and just with myself. I was so uncomfortable and I felt so disgusted in my own body and I didn't understand why. And washing, I, you'll see in the music video that's coming out this Sunday, um, it just, it was just never, I could never be satisfied. And I try and show that in the music video that I'm just uncomfortable. The music video has rain in it. So that symbolizes washing away, feeling dirty and feeling sad and feeling broken. Just everything that that man had done to me in that moment, it's just washing it all away. And I don't know, I just connect with the lyrics so much and I feel like it's just a strong, realization that I had in my life of washing him away and letting it all go. That is so powerful. So what message do you have for young girls that are maybe going through right now what you went through? The message I want to put out there is 
it's, first of all, you're never alone. Like what I said before, there's always someone closer than you think and more than you think that I've been through, if not exactly what you've been through or similar what you've been through, something along those lines. Everyone has, I believe that everyone has been through some form of abuse in their life, whether you wanna think of it as huge or minor or however you wanna think of it. It affects everyone differently. And the, wh however it affects you, it's okay. Whatever you feel, it's okay. I want little girls out there to know that whatever you're feeling, it's okay. And you are not what has happened to you. You are not a sexual assault. You are not any abuse that you have been put through. And it's usually, if not all the time, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but people do not abuse others because they just don't like them. You know, it's usually because of something that they're dealing with themselves and an abuser is, has usually been abused as well. So just not putting it on yourself and holding all of that, I don't know, that pressure that has been put on you. It's, it's not your responsibility, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. It, you don't have to take it all and put it, carry it around, you know, you can let it go. It's okay to feel your feelings. It's okay to let it go. It's okay to talk about it. It's okay to reach out. A big thing I want to get into other people's minds is to not judge yourself about especially after being abused and yeah I just I just really want little girls to get I want to get the point across that you are not what happened to you and there is always a light at the tunnel and do not ever be afraid to reach out to other people for help or just to talk so how can we hear the song, get the song? Where is it available at? So the song is available on all music platforms. Um, and my music video will be on YouTube and my Instagram, which is um, max.niece. And my YouTube channel is max. I'm max under all uh, music platforms. And the song is called No Good at Love. And that is Max with two X's, so M-A-X-X. -X. Yep, M-A-X-X. -X. And then for Instagram, it's M-A-X-X -X dot niece, N-I-E-S. Perfect. Well, Max, I'm really excited about your song coming out, and I really appreciate the message and getting to be able to spend some time with you here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, too. I don't know about you. I cried tears in my eyes. I'm really glad sometimes that I can mute my own microphone during interviews. What an amazing young lady. I hope you will go out and get her single. Support her in all that she's doing. Let her know that all of us here are here to support her as she takes the risk, as she steps out in faith and does that thing that she does so beautifully and wonderfully in the world and makes the difference in so many people's lives. We're gonna take another break and then we'll be right back here on Thriving Entrepreneur. If you're an author who's on a mission, stand out with your brand out. <laughs> Check this out, guys. Yep, everything's marketing, and marketing is everything. Your existing book can become a best-selling book, or even, hey, like mine, a number one international best-selling book in five days. Listen, if your business isn't known by everybody, it's obscurity and that's death, right? The same thing is true for your book. If you're not happy with the way your book is performing, you got that far and then it just fell off the face of the planet kind of feeling, go to yourbestsellertoday.com, schedule a talk with 
Steve. It's risk-free. It's guaranteed. It's proven. We've done it thousands of times. What are you waiting for? Yes, yourbestsellertoday.com. This time next week, you could have a beautiful seal on your book and get the attention that you deserve. Reach the people that you came to serve. Come on now. What are you waiting for? Grab a pen. Here we go. All you got to do is book a call, yourbestsellertoday.com. Go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Book a talk with Steve. It's proven. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. All you have to do is say yes to your destiny. Welcome back to Thriving Entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed the interview with Max as much as I did. Now I've got an amazing, brilliant expert here with us that is an expert in risk that can really help us break down why we should take the risk. Let us know what's involved in taking the risk and help incentivize us to really be able to step out in faith, to do the things that we can do, to be willing to take risks, because only in those risks do we really gain the greatest rewards. Join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Smith. Hey, Richard, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks. So tell us a little bit about who you are and how you show up in the world. A lot of different ways, but uh, all of them, I would say, connected to kind of helping um, other people and helping myself understand how things work, especially around uh, mathematics and risk, which is what my background is in. So I studied mathematics in undergrad, and then I went on to get a PhD in a field called systems science, where I did some work on the mathematics of uncertainty, and I was helping scientists and researchers be more honest about the uncertainty in their own models and not put in uh, false information, so to speak. And, um, and then that uh, led to me getting interested in investing and kind of understanding how risk works in investing, starting my own business, selling my business and starting a new business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So any of that sound familiar? <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, risk, especially when we're talking about investment, um, yeah. you know, it's just plagued with risk, especially these days. You know, I mean, one day the market's at 25, you know, the Dow, and then the next yeah. day it's at 20. And so how do we mitigate risk? Well, first of all, you have to kind of understand it. And um, what I find is that most people want to avoid risk. And in trying to avoid risk, they end up taking risks that they don't fully understand. So um, I was talking to my mother <clears throat> the other day, and I'm starting a new business. And uh, it's called, the name of the business is called Risk Smith. And she, and she asked me, what was the name of the, what's the name of the business? And I said, it's Risk Smith. And she goes, come on, you're kidding me. What, what's the, really the name of the business? I was like, no, that's really the name of the business. And she said, well, risk isn't a good thing. Why would you name your business Risk Smith? And I said, because people don't understand risk, mom. <laughs> you know, they're afraid of it. They think it's a bad four-letter word. And, and that's not the case at all. So the most powerful illustration I have of this, Steve, is something that uh, two Nobel Prizes in economics have been awarded for now. Uh, first to Daniel Kahneman and then to Richard Thaler. And that is, those Nobel Prizes were awarded for pointing out that we hate to lose. And so we try to avoid losing, right? So unfortunately, the fact that we hate to lose has different consequences depending on if we're losing on an investment or if we're winning on an investment. So bear with me here. Um, when you're losing on an investment, the fact that you hate to lose makes you not want to sell. So you'll double down, you'll rationalize why, um, you know, this was a short-term trade, but now it's a long-term investment, et cetera, et cetera. Anything but sell because bottom line is you hate to lose. But then when you're winning on an investment, your fear of loss attaches to your profits. And so the fact that you hate to lose 
makes you want to sell because you are afraid of losing your profits. So when you're losing on an investment, you don't want to sell. You want to double down. Um, you know, later on, Richard Thaler got the Nobel Prize for pointing out that not only do we want to not want to lose, but we want to get back out at break even, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and then conversely, when you're winning, you're afraid of losing your profits. So you have a mechanism for disaster, but you don't really have a mechanism for glory. Um, so does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. It sounds like a conversation I was actually having with my best friend. Um, he's a programmer. And so, you know, he's thinking programmer wise, how can I remove the emotions that I've found in my investing previously to put together an elegant program to just tell me this is when you should buy, this is when you should sell. And I don't know if that's really actually possible, but it does sound a lot like what he was saying. <laughs> yeah. So um, I started out the, the business that I built, I started in 2005, I built a website called tradestopsstops.com. And I was offering trailing stop loss alerts on stocks, okay? And um, what a trailing stop loss does, or a protective stop, I like to say now, is it makes you, so <laughs> let me go back to the Nobel Prize for just a minute, the, the technical um, expression of what Daniel Kahneman got his Nobel Prize for is that we are risk seeking when we're losing and we're risk averse when we're winning. Okay, so when, when, when we're losing, we want to take more risks to avoid the loss. And when we're winning, we want to take risk off the table to uh, help us not lose our profits. So a simple trailing stop makes you risk averse with your losses and makes you risk seeking with your winners. And, um, you know, because it's actually maybe even harder to hold on to a winner than it is to sell a loser. Most people don't realize if you have a 90% loss, you have to have a thousand percent gain to offset that 90% loss. So people, you know, will regularly experience 90% losses in some stocks that they don't want to let go of, but not many people experience thousand percent gains in some other stock, you know, to offset their 90% loss. So um, that just didn't make sense to me. And I saw that's what I was doing in my own investing. And I saw that's what tens of thousands of other people <laughs> were doing as well. And um, so even using a simple trailing stop loss, um, is a very powerful tool to reverse this bias that we all have. So from there, I went on and I developed some volatility-based approaches to stop losses. And it's all to overcome this loss aversion that we all have that undermines our decision-making. Remember how I said, you know, in trying to avoid risks, we actually end up taking risks that we didn't plan to. <laughs> so... Um, you know, you can see hopefully now how by trying to avoid loss, we actually end up losing. Yeah, that makes and, total sense. Yeah. And it's when we can kind of, you know, let go of that fear of loss, right? Recognize that losses aren't personal, that they're just a fact of being an investor, that sometimes you got to take them. Um, it totally changes the way that you think about investing. And more importantly, it totally changes the, um, the decisions that you make. And, you know, I can sympathize with your friend, the programmer who wants to write a program that'll take all the emotion out of investing. And I do think that algorithms, which is what programs are, have a very powerful place in the toolkit of investors. But, um, what I believe and what I've found to certainly be true for myself is that you can't fully take yourself out of the equation. You can't program um, success. You know, there's always a component of needing to be involved, needing to be engaged, needing to be paying attention and needing to, you know, own the fact that you are the one making the decisions. And um, I think that's uh, tough for a lot of people because it's kind of, takes responsibility. 
just sparked a whole new conversation him and I are going to have. So if I'm yeah. hearing you correctly, you really almost in that form of program have to also factor in that sometimes you're just going to lose. Absolutely. You know, I was drawing an analogy myself between learning to uh, investing and learning to fly a plane, you know, like the way most people think about investing, they're like, it would be as if you were going to say, Hey, I want to learn to fly a plane. And you just walk up to the plane and hop into the cockpit and head down the runway and, and, you know, not expect to die. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, that's kind of the attitude we have about investing. And that's the, that's kind of what we're encouraged to believe by, uh, you know, the, the businesses in the marketplace that make money off of us, uh, being engaged in the markets, not necessarily succeeding in the markets. Um, but, you know, pilots don't go up and say, oh, man, uh, you know, I just hit an air pocket. Uh, I must be a failure as a pilot. Right? <laughs> you don't take the weather personally, mm. but we do take the markets personally. You know, I remember early on in my experience as an investor thinking, you know, boy, as soon as I hit this buy button, the market's going to turn around and go down. As if somehow, you know, I was influencing the markets <laughs> because, you know, somehow hitting the buy button on my keyboard or maybe they got a camera in my office or, a, you know, a keystroke logger on my computer and they're just waiting for me to hit buy so they can turn around and send this stock down. Right. I mean, it's amazing that the market can kind of make everybody feel this way, but it's really not the market doing it. It's ourselves doing it to ourselves. It's ourselves taking things personally that we have no business taking personally. Losses are not a personal affront in the market. They are a part of doing business. And if you're not okay with that, you should not be in the market. So um, I find thinking about flying a plane and thinking about the weather, for example, versus and, and kind of you know, using that as an analogy for the markets uh, is very helpful because it really, you know, depersonalizes it. And, um, you know, you can't take the markets personally. Absolutely. So tell me if I'm going too far here, um, but, you know, I, I you can never go too research. far. <laughs> um, when we Let's take go. that outside of the market and we just look at it as our business people, do you yeah. think that's maybe one of the biggest places people fail is, is they don't have as part of their plan that there are going to be downtimes and even losses in their company? Absolutely. And, you know, most people don't have a plan at all. Um, and if you do have a plan, you certainly don't have a plan for failure. And uh, I think that is a major um, inefficiency, let's just say, uh, in how we go about making decisions. You know, we don't plan for failure and um, we don't plan for difficulties. And it's oftentimes, you know, when you do plan for those things, you find that um, they become your biggest opportunities. You know, so for example, um, you know, the recent stock market crash, right? If you had um, <clears throat> had some capital set aside for a rainy day, it was a wonderful buying opportunity. You actually relished prices going down because <laughs> you're like, oh my God, I can finally get into Tesla at $450 a share instead of 900. And um, so, yeah, you have to plan for tough times. And I think that's true in investing. I think it's true in business. And I think it's true in life. And then those tough times, you know, become opportunities. Such great insight. I really appreciate that. So with the current craziness, you know, up yeah. and down and up and down, if you could just take the next couple of minutes and give people some teaching on how they can understand you know, kind of how their own self works uh, to be mm -hmm. able to be more effective through the cycles of life? I know that's a huge question, but if you could just kind of give us a little tip on it. Well, 
it's funny that you bring up the term cycles because um, I'm very interested in cycles. In fact, I'm currently the chairman and CEO of the Foundation for the Study of Cycles. People can learn more about this at cycles.org, O-R-G. It's a not-for-profit 501c3 institution, 80 years old, dedicated to the, uh, the study and discovery of cycles in, in our world. It was actually founded in the early 1940s by a gentleman named Edward Dewey, who was the uh, chief economic analyst in the Hoover administration. And he was tasked with, uh, by President Hoover, of um, trying to understand what caused the Great, the great Depression and the stock market crash. And um, you know, he talked to 100 different economists about what caused the, uh, the Depression, and he got 100 different answers. <laughs> And it made him uh, kind of lose faith in, in, uh, in economists. And um, so he started studying behavior and price and eventually connected like cycles in business and, and the economy to cycles in the stock market and cycles in uh, wildlife biology and sunspot cycles, et cetera, et cetera. So... Um, I think that cycles very much are a part of our world and our lives. You know, I think that um, what we're going through right now is uh, in part a cycle of panic. And, um, you know, the panic that people are experiencing right now is worse than um, the disease, so to speak. And I think that when people have an awareness of cycles, um, not only can you do a better job of kind of forecasting the future, um, but it just kind of brings some perspective to things that, um, you know, this too shall pass. And, uh, you know, that it's probably not the end of the world, um, but rather that it's, you know, a cycle. Perfect. I really appreciate that. And for somebody who wants to go deeper with you, um, with, with Risk Smith and those yeah. kind of things, how can they get in contact with you? Um, right now, the easiest way is at my website, my personal website, richardmsmith.com. Um, but also really the Foundation for the Study of Cycles, cycles.org. And we have a uh, week-long free event coming up uh, June 22nd to 26th, uh, where it's going to be two hours a day of um, talking and learning about cycles and financial markets. And people can learn about that event and sign up for it at events.cycles.org. You'll learn a lot about how to use cycles in the financial markets, but you'll also learn a lot about how cycles influence our lives and what role they play in the world we live in. Richard, I appreciate you so much for spending some time with us on this show here today. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been great. Appreciate you having me. Wow. Was that mind blowing or what? I don't know about you, but I learned a lot about risk. It makes me want to even take greater risks and to really understand how to embrace risk in my life, to be able to do the things that only I can do, to make the difference in this world that I was meant to make. And I hope and pray for you that you will do the same thing too, that you find yourself taking the risk and having the rewards that come from it. We're going to take another break and then we'll be right back here on Thriving Entrepreneur. If you're an author who's on a mission, stand out with your brand out. 
<laughs> Check this out, guys. Yep, everything's marketing, and marketing is everything. Your existing book can become a best selling book, or even, hey, like mine, a number one international best selling book in five days. Listen, if your business isn't known by everybody, it's obscurity and that's death, right? The same thing is true for your book. If you're not happy with the way your book is performing, you got that far and then it just fell off the face of the planet kind of feeling, go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Schedule a talk with Steve. It's risk free, it's guaranteed, it's proven. We've done it thousands of times. What are you waiting for? Yes, yourbestsellertoday.com. This time next week, you could have a beautiful seal on your book and get the attention that you deserve. Reach the people that you came to serve. Come on now. What are you waiting for? Grab a pen. Here we go. All you got to do is book a call, yourbestsellertoday.com. Go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Book a talk with Steve. It's proven. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. All you have to do is say yes to your destiny. Welcome back to Thriving Entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome back. I hope you are learning a lot today about taking the risk. And I hope that you're feeling incentivized to take risks in your life. I want to share with you one last amazing guest and all of the things that she did, stepping away from a very good, very comfortable job to do more, to really take the risk and be who she knew she wanted to be in this world. Join me in welcoming Laura Gale. Hey, Laura, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Steve. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks. I appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about you and what got you to this point in life. Well, I grew up in a big family in Australia and uh, being one of many children, I passed most of my time reading and I really fell into that early and kind of never, never got out again. And I ended up working in the publishing industry and after um, many years working on um, some really incredible projects, I decided that it was time to strike out on my own and um, I've been fortunate to be able to take all of the skills that I learned in that publishing house and transfer them to serving entrepreneurs who want to publish books of their own. And we're going to dive really deep into publishing your bestseller here. But first, let's just geek out on some mutual fun stuff that we have in common. What was it like working on the Twilight books? <laughs> Those books absolutely took, I mean, the world by storm, but certainly um, the publishing house. So I was at um, a publishing house called Hachette, which is one of the big four publishing houses in the world. And uh, the Twilight books were published by a division of, of Hachette. And so I got there kind of in the midst of everything. So I was really thrown in the deep end. You know, I was really new to being a publicist and, and working in the industry. And it was just full tilt. So, I mean, there were just masses of events and media clamoring for coverage like you wouldn't believe. I mean, so often we had to work really, really hard to get the media to cover the books that we were producing, but we could not keep up with the demand. So it was a trial by fire, I'd have to say, but it was honestly one of the best experiences I had because it really taught me how creative you can be in, in publicity and how it can be it can kind of create its own wave when, when there's this zeitgeist around something. So thinking about how to kind of generate that organic momentum has been something that has really stayed with me. So in book space, I know you help people create their books, but the thing you really love doing is ghostwriting people's books. Um, just to give somebody who might not understand what that is, give people an understanding of what being a ghostwriter is. Sure. So basically that process is um, I get with the client and they tell me what they want to write their book about. And in my case, it's usually entrepreneurs who are wanting to write about their businesses. And basically I'll just develop a structure uh, for the book with them and then interview them to cover everything that they want to talk about. And maybe a bit more, I like to kind of get beneath the surface and get as much information as I can. But basically I get all of that information and then take it away and turn it into the book essentially. So I'm writing as them. They tell me everything, um, all of their experiences, all of their insights, um, you know, everything that they've done to get to this point. And I 
take that and turn it into a book that they're really proud of. And often it's simply because they either don't have the time to write a book themselves. You know, they're busy, they're successful, they're running their own businesses and it's not the best use of their time to write a book themselves. Um, or they don't feel confident in, in their writing skills. And that's totally understandable because it's a completely different skill set to what a lot of entrepreneurs have focused on. Um, so I'm really there to bring their story to life and to be um, a mouthpiece for them. Um, I shouldn't really be present in the book at all. It's, it's entirely focused on them. So what are some of the interesting people that you helped ghostwrite their books? Um, so, I mean, some of them I can't mention, but um, there's always a bit of an NDA element involved, but um, I've been fortunate to work with um, Curie Masters, who runs um, a large Amazon advertising agency, Russ Perry, who started Design Pickle, which is one of the biggest design agencies in the world. Um, I worked with Brian Kurtz on getting his book together. He's um, a big name in the direct response marketing industry and has been um, very entrepreneurially involved for many years. Um, that book was published by Hay House uh, in the end, which was great. Um, yeah, there've, there've been a lot I collaborated with Marcella Allison, who's a um, top direct response copywriter. So yeah, there's been a, a wide range, but it definitely, each project is very different. And um, I really enjoy working across lots of different industries because there's always a good cross pollination of ideas, which makes each project a bit more interesting. And how many authors would you say you've worked with so far now? Um, I've published about 20 books. So most of those are individual projects, but I think three have now done two books. Perfect. All right. So what have you learned moving from being a publicist to helping people directly doing their books? What do people not understand about their need to put a book out in the world? I think of a book as really the ultimate way to build your authority. So for somebody who has an established business, it's really, I think, one of the most effective ways to take your business to the next level. It's not an entry level marketing strategy, not at all, because you um, get a lot of exposure if you do the marketing right. And you need to make sure that your systems can handle that increase in interest. Um, but for somebody who is prepared and who knows how to do their marketing and has a good sort of scalable system, then it can be a huge accelerant um, because it does identify you as an authority. It gives you an opportunity to really establish that know, like, and trust trifecta with your ideal audience. And basically by the time somebody has gotten all the way through reading your book, they've gotten to know you. It's a really intimate process. And so they understand how you think, they understand how you speak. And they've really identified whether or not they um, sort of see themselves being in alignment with you. It's a really easy filter to make sure that the right people are coming into contact with your business. So for most of my clients, they find that people who have read their books are almost always immediately ready to work with them. It doesn't take any long sales process. It doesn't take any big convincing. It's just, you know, they've, they've invested all of this time and energy already they know you, they get what you're doing. And if they have gone through that whole process and still get in touch, then you can be pretty confident that they're um, going to be interested in going ahead with you. So you said having the right type of marketing for your book. Um, what is the right type of marketing for your book? Uh, well, any marketing is better than no marketing. So that's a start. But um, I, I think a lot of authors kind of get to um, the completion of the book, they get to publication and they feel like, whoa, okay, that was a big effort. I've, I've done, you know, everything that I needed to do. It's out in the world now. And they, it's really stopping halfway. You know, if you get to publication and you haven't done any marketing, you can't expect that people will read it. And so the marketing, I think, starts early in the process, long before you get to publication. You want to be really seeding interest in your audience and, and trying to line up some opportunities to make sure it goes a bit further afield than your existing audience as well. But um, I would say that podcasts are an extremely effective way to spread the word about your book. If you have an established 
paid marketing system, then plugging your book into your ads funnels uh, works really well. If you have email marketing, then you can do a whole pre-launch campaign and a post-launch campaign. Um, you can do Amazon advertising, which also allow you to do um, a pre-launch campaign. So you can um, take orders in advance of the book being available, which allows you to create a lot of interest and do some fun um, bonus programs and that kind of thing. So really you can be as creative as you like with with marketing your book but i would say you want to start early and focus on the marketing strategies that you're already good at don't try to learn something new when marketing your book um do do what you know works and then once that sort of flywheel is spinning up with the book involved then you can start thinking about a couple of new avenues so of all the ways you can think of to leverage your book after it's out um what would you say is the best way to leverage your book I am a big believer in the power of physical interactions. And so if you are um, speaking at an event or you are even just attending an event, I would take copies with you to hand out to people that you meet so that um, if you meet someone who you think would be a good fit for working together, you can hand them a copy of the book and say, hey, I think you'd be really interested in chapter four. I think this is going to be great for you. Um, another way to use it physically is to send copies of your book to your ideal client. So write them a note, stick it in inside the front cover and say, hi, you know, I, I was looking at your website. I think that this is going to be a really good fit. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a pattern interrupt. It's not um, something that's easily ignored. You know, if you get a big package in the mail from somebody and they've taken the time to really familiarize themselves with your business and then sent you a book about it, it's, it's pretty striking. So obviously that works really well with people that you know already. Um, it's, it's maybe not as effective coming in cold, but certainly I would say those uh, high touch interactions are really valuable. Um, and then as well as, as a way of, you know, using part of the book as a sample to get people onto your email list or into your traffic funnels. Um, you know, it's a really, really appealing um, piece of content to give away. And so if you intend to uh, sell a, a bigger ticket item on the back of the book sale than using it up front um, to get leads into into that offer is really effective as well. What would you say is the biggest holdup you've found people have for getting their book done? Mostly it's time and not understanding what the process is. Um, there are a lot of moving parts and people get a bit daunted. I think, you know, they realize that it's going to be a lot of time and effort to actually write the book, but then they don't know how to get it formatted, they don't know how to list it on the publication platforms, they don't know the steps to market it. So there's just a lot of unknowns for a lot of people. And while it is a complicated process, it's not, um, it's not unmanageable and, and there are systems out there to help you do it. So what would be the number one tip you would give to somebody who hasn't written their book yet um, to get them going down the process of getting their book done? Um, I would think, to me, the most important thing is not to count yourself out because you don't think you're good enough at writing. I think a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm never going to write like so-and-so, and so I'm not even going to try. And no one starts out as good as their idols. And so, you know, just making a start is often the hardest part, just getting past that self-perception. And one thing I've found very helpful for getting, um, at least for my coaching students, getting them to get started has been to have them start with something on the page already. If you're facing down a blank page, a blank screen, it's really difficult to, to start because you feel like, oh, I need to write something important. I need to write something that's powerful. And it's rare that the first thing you write is, is going to be that thing. So even if it's just... I'm having my coffee this morning. I'm looking at my dog. He's running around like crazy. Like just write anything, whatever comes to mind, get kind of a rhythm going, just start. It doesn't matter. You can delete it later. And then you'll kind of get to a point after a few minutes where you are like, Oh, okay, this is the theme of what I want to talk about. This is the idea I want to hone in on. And it might take you a page or two even to, to really get in the zone, but allow yourself just to start and get rid of all of the stuff that comes before what you really want to focus on. So somebody that wants to work with you, how would they get in contact with you? Uh, so the best way is through my website, lauraiswriting.com. Um, I've got ghostwriting, editing, and coaching programs over there. So 
Um, just let me know which is the best fit for you and we'll go from there. Well, I really appreciate your time today and your insights in getting that book done. It's so powerful and so important. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate it. You stand today on the edge of opportunity. You're looking out over the vastness of the canyon in front of you. And all you need to do is leap. But you're afraid. I get it. I've been there many, many times myself. Will the wind carry you? If you stretch out your wings, do you really know how to fly? You see, here's the thing. It's only when the eagle leaps off of the edge of the cliff that the air is able to fill their wings and allow them to soar up on high. They could stay in the safety of that shelf on the cliff and it would be fine there. But they would never, they would never soar. Little baby eagles, they actually ride on their mom's backs, soaring around, flying up high with their moms. And eventually, the mom has to make them take a leap of faith. She literally does a barrel roll and they fall. And they are convinced that they are going to crash to the ground and die. Because they don't understand that mom's wings allows her to fly much faster than they can fall. And she catches them. But she does it again until eventually they also stretch out their wings and then they are aloft, up on high, soaring as the eagle that they are. That's what life has for you. That's the future that I know is yours. But it takes that leap. It involves taking the risk. And that's scary. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you, oh, well, it's no big deal. It's just a precipice. You know, just jump. <laughs> no, I understand the terrifyingness that is standing there on the edge just before you jump. Maybe you've done it before and maybe you have soared up in the heavens or maybe you've never flown before. Either way, the fear is real. It's only by, in the face of that fear, taking the risk that we ever receive the really great rewards in life. And most importantly, that we impact the lives of the people that we were meant to impact. The people's lives that we can and will change, but that will only happen when we take the risk, when we take the leap, when we are willing to risk it all because we need to soar. You see, you are uniquely brilliant. You were created for a purpose and the world needs you. But that only happens when you take that leap when you are willing to take the risk to step out boldly in faith knowing that the universe will meet you and that you will soar. You may have taken that jump and you feel like you're careening towards the ground and I encourage you today, stretch out your wings. You can do it. You can fly. This risk was worth it and now is your time to live as a thriving entrepreneur. You've got this, and I'm here for you in any way that I can help, because I wanna see you live as a thriving entrepreneur. Until next time, have a great week. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. If you wanna get your question answered, send an email to questions at wehelpyouthrive.com. We look forward to you joining us again next time.
author who's on a mission. Stand out with your brand out. <laughs> Check this out, guys. Yep, everything's marketing, and marketing is everything. Your existing book can become a best-selling book, or even, hey, like mine, a number one international best-selling book in five days. Listen, if your business isn't known by everybody, it's obscurity and that's death, right? The same thing is true for your book. If you're not happy with the way your book is performing, you got that far and then it just fell off the face of the planet kind of feeling, go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Schedule a talk with Steve. It's risk-free. It's guaranteed. It's proven. We've done it thousands of times. What are you waiting for? Yes, yourbestsellertoday.com. This time next week, you could have a beautiful seal on your book and get the attention that you deserve. Reach the people that you came to serve. Come on now. What are you waiting for? Grab a pen. Here we go. All you got to do is book a call, yourbestsellertoday.com. Go to yourbestsellertoday.com. Book a talk with Steve. It's proven. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. All you have to do is say yes to your destiny. You